What's up guys? Welcome back to Fish Hex. This is Travis. Today I'm going to be answering 10 common questions that every saltwater hobbyist has asked at one point or another. Now this is going to be focused for beginners. If you've been here for a while, there's a good chance you already know all this stuff, but stick around to the end of the video because I'm going to be going over what some of the plans are for this series and then also talking about some things that are going to happen to this channel and for you guys after the new year. So stick around for that. Either way, let's go ahead and get started. All right, number one, should I replace the evaporated water in my reef tank with fresh water or salt water? The answer to that question is fresh water. And I think a lot of people take it for granted and assume that people already know. But the reality is if people already knew, they wouldn't be asking on the forums all the time. The uh, only exception to the rule is if you're trying to elevate your salinity slowly over a period of time. I have in the past taken a five gallon auto top off container and put in 1.025 worth of salt just because my water was quite low in salinity in my reef tank for whatever reason. I think it was before I really got into coral. And uh, basically I needed to get it up from say 1.023 to 1.025. And instead of dumping cups of salt into the reef tank, you could add salt to your auto top off. And when it uh, obviously fills up the water, it's actually putting salt water in, which will slowly elevate the salinity. And the important thing is you need to keep an eye on it to make sure that you stop topping off of salt water when you get to the desired salinity level. So yes, you can use salt water when you're trying to make adjustments in salinity, but every other time you need to use fresh RODI water. Okay, number two, can I use tap water in my reef tank? The quick answer is no, absolutely not. Not even with Prime or any other dechlorinator. Now I will do a separate video part of the series regarding RODI units and water filtration, which I'll get more in depth on all that. But to further answer the question, you really don't know what's in your water. As for phosphates and nitrates, you don't really know what other chemicals there might be. I know around here, my TDS fluctuates from 150 to 300, and that is really, really high. Now, I guess it just depends on who's flushing the toilet near me, really. At the end of the day, you really don't want to add any of that water to your reef tank because it could potentially cause algae blooms. You could have a hair algae issue that is just ridiculously bad. I've seen it. You could kill your fish. You can kill your coral. It's just nonsense that you don't want to mess with. So go out and spend the money on a reverse osmosis deionization system, like I mentioned in a previous video, and you'll be good to go. Okay, number three. Can I put a canister filter on my reef tank? And the answer is yes, you can do that as long as you do a few things to minimize the negative impact that it will have on the reef tank, which I will get to here in a second. But the majority of us do not use canister filters. And the reason why is they are considered nitrate factories. What I mean by that is the purpose of a canister filter is to suck up detritus and hold it. And then, uh, you know, you clean the filter every week or every two weeks or whatever, and that removes the detritus from the system. Now, the problem is with the saltwater aquarium, that detritus will get trapped in, say, the sponges, and then it will break down from the bacteria, and then it will release nitrates and phosphates into the water column, causing you to have uh, potentially algae issues because of it. But if you decide to use a canister filter, I recommend you remove all the sponges and any kind of filter media that will trap detritus. If you just fill up those sections with rubble rock or marine pier, you can still force flow through them, which will you know, aid in filtration without catching all the detritus. I would still clean out the filter every week or every two weeks, depending on uh, you know your bio load, but a canister filter really isn't needed at all. It's not part of the filtration. It's not part of flow. It's, uh, it's kind of one of those things that just kind of creeped over from the freshwater hobby, and people still think they need them. All right, number four, how much rock do I need for my reef tank? Now, I recommend between one to two pounds per gallon, but it's not uncommon to see three or four pounds per gallon. Now, at the end of the day, the more rock you have, the more surface area you have for beneficial bacteria to grow to process waste. If you like a lot of rock in your tank, this should be easy to add and have a lot of rock. But in my case, I have under one pound per gallon uh, just because I really don't like a lot of rock, as you guys can see. But I do make up for the beneficial bacteria issue with marine pier blocks in a sump. I have four eight by eight by four inch marine pier blocks that offers uh, about 20,000 square feet of surface area per marine pier block. So that's how I make up for my beneficial bacteria filtration. Another option you have is you can always add another tank to the system. Now I know a guy who has a 125 gallon reef with a 125 gallon sump and then another 125 gallon tank in another room with just rock in it. That's all part of the same filtration. So those are some of the options that you have. Okay, number five, should I use live or dry rock in my reef tank? Now I highly recommend against live rock from the ocean and let me explain why. When it comes to live rock, not only is it completely overpriced and ridiculous, uh, you also have the potential of adding nuisance critters, red bugs, nudibranchs, uh, just 
you know, horrible stuff that you can add to your reef tank that you really won't know until the tank is kind of established. You start adding coral and you're like, wow, why is my acro being eaten alive? You know, and then you have to spend money on medications and hopefully treat that issue or you have to buy a specific fish that eats that type of um, critter. So it's just a huge pain in the ass that you should probably avoid. Also, um, you know, you don't want to pull stuff out of the ocean as much, you know, we love this hobby. So we kind of, if we want to keep the hobby going, we got to stop pulling shit out of the ocean. Uh, because that's going to negatively impact our hobby. So I always recommend that you get the dry rock. It's the reef saver stuff. I think it's like 250 or something like that, a pound. You probably get it a lot cheaper somewhere else. Who knows? Either way, it's from a dead reef that's been dug up. It doesn't have any die off. And if you want, you can still cure it, uh, you know, in a bucket of salt water for a few weeks just to make sure, you know, regarding die off. But it's, uh, it's pretty easy to maintain. And uh, cycling with it might take a little bit longer, but it's worth it in the end when you don't have to deal with those parasites and critters and all that kind of crap all right number six what light should i put over my tank now this is a very in-depth topic but i'm only going to break it down to a couple things to keep it short number one budget if the sky's the limit for you go out and get the higher end radions hook them up to your apex and be done with it you can do any type of tank with those you'd be good to go even throw in some t5 accent lighting just to spice it up a little bit now for those of us who are on a budget you kind of have to plan ahead now regardless if you have a fish only tank if you ever plan on doing coral or whatever i recommend you get a light that you can grow with so starting off with an sb reef light or an aqua mars light it's a little bit cheaper I've grown this reef tank with both types of lights. I just recently switched to SB Reef Light probably well, six months ago. And uh, they're all, you know, and you can still connect them to the Apex. I have that video on the channel as well. But uh, with that light, you can do whatever you want in the hobby, essentially. I can grow pretty much any SPS I want with the SB Reef Light. And I can even have a fish only tank, you know, with the lights a little bit lower. You know, you can do whatever you want with these LED lights. I also have T5 high output accent lights in here just to kind of fill in any shading. You can also do that. But what I recommend is get a light that you can grow with. Don't just go out and buy a two bulb T5 high output fixture and then expect to grow SPS with it. You're going to have to upgrade your lighting. So might as well get what you want now that fits your budget and grow with it. All right, number seven, another question regarding lighting. How long should I run my blues and how long should I run my whites for? Now, I always recommend you have your blues come on before your whites just to kind of wake up the coral and the fish before the lights get really bright. And then also let the whites turn off first and then let the blues kind of settle down, closing out the night or at least the photo period. Now, personally, I run my blues for 12 hours a day and my whites for 10 hours. Uh, basically, I mean, that's the time I'm up during the day. So I like to see my reef tank for the entire time that I'm up. Um, I don't like walking around the house with a tank that's black that just looks, you know, what's the point of that? Now, you can get away with having your uh, photo period between uh, 6 to 12 hours. I've even seen it uh, less than 6 hours. I've even seen it longer than 12 hours. But the sweet spot is between 6 and 12 hours photo period, uh, both, uh, you know, with blues and whites. So I recommend that you at least have your blues start on first, let your whites run for the day, let your whites turn off, and then let your blues kind of finish out. All right, number eight, what salt should I use? Now, this is just like the lighting question. It pretty much comes down to your budget and your current goals. Now, if you have an unlimited budget, go ahead and get the $90 bucket of salt because you can. You'd be good to go with that. Now, if you can't do that, I recommend you base your salt off of what your current goals are. So if you have a fish only or a soft coral tank, the instant ocean salt is perfect for that. You won't have any issues. Now, if you're moving on to LPS and SPS tank, I recommend getting the reef crystals because it has a higher uh, percentage of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, which is always good for those, uh, you know, those hard skeleton corals. They need to use that to grow. And, uh, you know, it's always good to have the higher concentration. So at the end of the day, you really don't have to dose as much if you are dosing two part. Now, one thing I want to mention that I mentioned in the previous video is you always want to mix up all your salt ahead of time to make sure you evenly distribute the calcium alkalinity so you make consistent batches of salt water. All right, number nine, what do I use to test salinity in my reef tank? Now, a lot of people, and I've made this mistake before, use hydrometers. Uh, they are notoriously inaccurate, and they can be a pain in the butt. Unless you spend a lot of money to get a high-quality one, you get a little bit more accuracy out of it. I recommend you just skip that. Go ahead and get the refractometer or spend even more money and get like a digital uh, Milwaukee kind of thing. Uh, but I recommend the refractometer because it's like 20 30 bucks, depending on where you get it. It can be calibrated, and it's accurate. So go ahead and get the refractometer, and you'll be good to go. All right, number 10, and this will be the last question in this video, and that is, how long until I can add fish to my new tank? Now, I recommend you do a fishless cycle. I know you can buy bacteria, you can use a piece of shrimp to cycle the tank, but you want to cycle the tank between four to six weeks before adding any fish. That's what I recommend. Now, there are some additives where you can immediately put a fish in afterward. I have never used them. I don't recommend them. I just do it the old school way because, you know, it works, and that's why I do it that way. 
Now, what I suggest you do is if you want to buy a fish in your tank the same day, go ahead and purchase a secondary tank that you can set up as a quarantine system. I have plenty of videos on how to set up quarantine tanks. You can go ahead and set up both systems at the same time, the same day, and then run a fishless cycle while your fish is in quarantine. And then once that four to six weeks is up, you can go ahead and throw your fish in the tank, parasite free, and then you'll be good to go. And you don't have to worry about introducing any of that into the new tank. So that's what I recommend regarding adding fish. Well, guys, that's about it for this video. I appreciate you sticking around. If you have any questions, please put it in the comment section below or contact me directly via Facebook or email. I will get back to you. Now, regarding this series, I plan on adding several more parts. Plus, I plan on answering questions on specific topics just on that topic so it's not so broad. Now, one thing I want to mention before I let you go is this channel. Now, I plan on adding several more videos. I'm trying to increase my volume of videos and get out these questions, at least getting them answered as quickly as possible out to you guys. Now, you guys did like the top 10, top 14, 15 kind of videos that I've made recently, so I might stick to that for a little bit, just depending on how you guys like it. Um, basically, the channel has so many different ways it can go, and I'm just trying to figure out what will work best. I kind of want to get on a more personal level with you guys, because that's something that I haven't done, and I've been getting some complaints about it, is I kind of distance myself from everybody, and I really don't, uh, I don't show my face, I don't show anything, really. You guys see my forearms, my tattoos, and my hands. That's pretty much the extent, for exception, of about two videos on my channel. And uh, I might start uh, showing myself more and kind of getting a more personal touch with you guys. We'll see how that works out. If you guys haven't noticed, that's not really my personality. Um, but I'm willing to try new things to see how they work out. And, you know, everyone learns and grows differently. So we'll see how it works. Now, regarding uh, the new year, I do have some several things going on outside of this channel. I have a new website that I'm building. It just, you know, takes time since I'm doing it myself. I plan on selling frag plugs. I have a bunch of t-shirt designs that are already ready to go that will be going on that website. Um, also, I plan on selling breakout boxes, different types of equipment, one-on-one -on -one time if you so choose. There's my blog will be on there, pictures, more personal information. So I'll, you guys will be able to get a little bit more in depth and, um, you know, outside of YouTube. All right, so I appreciate you guys watching the video as always. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Obviously, please subscribe. I like to see the channel grow. That inspires me to make more videos, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.